You're listening to a Rock Candy podcast. I like that get to play. I like that get to play. I like that get to play. I like it. Don't call me murder when I be the man that I need. John, today on Magnified Pod, we welcome Dr. Daniel Otto, Autobot, Jack Peterson. <laughs> you know him as one of the founding members and vocalists for Blaster the Rocket Man, and he is currently living and teaching in Scotland, where he continues to write. Otto, welcome to Magnified Pod. Thank you very much, guys. I'm really pleased to, to be here. We were so psyched that you uh started talking with us a bit behind the scenes because i think it's safe to say that uh in our magna fright pod month of spooky band analysis yes blaster was the one that floored us like (laughs) (laughs) there was so much to talk about and um unfortunately neither of us were super aware of you guys at the time that you were in the scene but we kept hearing throughout the few years that we've been doing the show that we need to get to you at some point. And you just sounded so much like a band that would be on my, li- on my wavelength. And you yes. totally were for both of us. Um, so it was, it was so fun to go through uh, monster who ate Jesus specifically for the pod, but also just in sort of weighing the whole blaster history where you went from there, the work you're doing now um, you just seemed like the kind of person we couldn't wait to, to talk to and to, to talk more about some of this stuff with. So we were very, very happy that you could join us. Yeah, cool. I, I loved listening to you guys do that. Although as I've told you, it was, I was cringing as well as, <laughs> as, as enjoying it. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I, lo- I loved the time you put into it and the love you put into it. And, uh, and once I found out what you guys were doing with this podcast and everything, I was like, Oh, this is totally cool. I, I, I I'm, I'm coming from a quite similar place and I really appreciate what you guys are doing and enjoy it. So. Thanks. We try to, we try to balance the opportunities for cringe with the opportunities to <laughs> shout out, uh, you know, genuine innovation and, and musical mm-hmm. uh, prowess because uh, I mean, Blaster musically is by far one of the most interesting acts we've talked about on the show. Um, for sure the variety yeah. of songs and, and the, uh, you know, ambition of what you were trying to do. So uh, there, you know, th- there was plenty there for us to chew on uh, from a, can you believe how great this is? And a like, well, <laughs> what does this mean? Kind of a yeah, totally. <laughs> position. So totally. um, to kind of kick things off, we, we do want to hear kind of about, um, you know, each stage of your artistic career and your, and your writing and, and academic work, but to talk a little bit about how Blaster came to be, I mean, what was the environment that you and Dave grew up in? I assume you were both musically proficient from an early age. It seems like you were both, uh, you know, capable on uh, songwriting and on instruments and all, all kinds of things. It, my brother is the musical genius. And it's so funny you guys kept using the word savant or something like that. When you were guys, and I was like, oh, well, I'm like, oh, my savant, you know. And that's how I felt when I was feeling good about And then when you would get into like the parts of the lyrics that I'm embarrassed of. I was like, oh, I wrote that like the night before, you know? <laughs> I was <laughs> totally. thinking about it, you know? <laughs> so I was kind of switching back and forth in my head. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, well, my brother played instru- played drums from an early age and then would, it was funny, I can remember in the earliest practices, you know, cause he joined the band at like 13 or something. Cause we just needed somebody on skins and didn't have anybody. And I was like, oh, my brother practices all the time. Let's just let him get on. And then he like killed it. And we were like, oh my gosh, he's so good. But he would sit around and he would he would play drums and watch everybody else play. And then afterwards, he'd pick up the bass and do all the bass lines, and pick up wow. the guitar and do all the guitar lines. We're like, oh, shit, this guy can do everything. <laughs> yeah. So um, so he was he. Yeah, he's very musically gifted, the multi instrumentalist and, and all that kind of thing. And I'm just a guy with a bunch of words in my head that wants to jump around on the stage and like shout out, you know, vocals and try to sing every now and again and stuff like that. So that that's that's the divide there the kind of the musical uh um workload divide between us you know and he did write a a handful of um of the lyrics here and there he would bring a song and you typically as the big brother he's like seven years younger than me i would i'd be like yeah yeah this is cool and then i would change about half the lyrics you know kind of fix them you know (laughs) and Uh that kind of stuff but but mainly i have to take the the brunt of of all the lyric writing that was all pretty much me 
Um, and then I occasionally I would write a song on guitar, roughly, you know, kind of put something together and then let, let the guys actually play it correctly and stuff like that. But that was mainly my brother doing the songwriting. A couple of the other guys in the bands did a bit of the songwriting, but my dad was a piano player, proficient piano player. He played by ear. So he just kind of was musical. He didn't like have any training or anything. And he played in like a 50s rock band in the Navy. And then he played in, in, in an early Christian rock band in the late 60s, I think, called mm. Eternal Rush. Mm. And they went around with this, uh, this preacher guy. Um, what was his name? Arthur Blessed, which is his real name, I think. Um, oh. <laughs> um, and uh, they, would, they would play a set and then they would like jam for a half hour while he like preached stuff. Um, to like hippies and stuff <laughs> so that so I kind of come from a, a background of like Christian rock died in the wool Christian rock type stuff sure I mean I feel like the savant label applies across the board like instrumentally yes but it's also the the ambition of the lyrics and the themes and, and what you were trying to pull off is really impressive for teenagers so I think that's more what we kept returning to is like it's one thing to sort of the fact that he was that Dave was, you know, uh, a multi instrumentalist and, and took to things easily, but I feel like it's either usually the musical, uh, you know, achievement level is high, but maybe the lyrics or, or or the themes aren't at that level, or vice versa. But the fact that they were both just like so fully formed at such a, a young age, I think, is what we kept being like uh, surprised by. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And to be fair, I mean, full disclosure, I was more in my early 20s by the time we were making the albums and stuff. Sure. And even by, you know, the monster who ate Jesus, I would say I was around 25 when I was writing those lyrics or something like that. But yeah. also what I was was a kid who didn't go to college, didn't go to university or anything and didn't know I needed to and really wanted to until many, many years later. Mm. So I was I was like almost trying to work out my little uh, uh, outsider liberal arts education through lyrics you know <laughs> like I was like, mm, like yeah. reading all these books and then trying to put them into songs you know and like <laughs> you're like little art project or something and yeah so it was it was kind of a big a big mess a big you know well-meaning kind of like wannabe intellectual sort of like a mess that had to take decades to kind of come to a, a more solid sort of coherence <laughs> So, I mean, speaking of stuff that you just mentioned you were reading, um, presumably some of that was C.S. Lewis, but what were some of your other influences, it, you know, in terms of literature or music at the time? Well, musically, it was all the punk stuff. And then, you know, uh, Nick Cave became a big influence. So, mm -hmm. you know, he was quite uh, a literary writer. So even though I don't think my lyrics really sound like his, he kind of gave some of that precedent of like bringing almost like a book type style short storytelling style and stuff not the to to lyrics you know um but um I'm trying to think of uh it's probably the main sort of arty sort of musical influence at that time um besides all the standard punk stuff you'd guess but um uh the other people i was reading I'd say the other big fictional influence would be Flannery O'Connor, although mm -hmm. I don't think that really shows up a whole lot in the lyrics per se, but I I kind of fell in love with Lewis's fiction and, and Flannery O'Connor's fiction r right around the same time at like 20 years old or something. Mm. Um, so that was definitely in, in the mix. Um, and then I, I was reading anything I could get my hands on. I, I really liked um, kind of like graduate level, um, like, bible commentaries and stuff i just really mm. like to read oh so that's the greek word there and all that kind of <laughs> stuff you know i just it was just i just needed an education and didn't know it and i was just like reading all these books you know but mm. i um uh one that now i would be less i not as not so proud of would be like francis schaefer um okay I don't, yeah which he he's one of those guys that you know when you're young and you don't know what's going on he just seems so intellectual and so right. like he's He's mentioning, uh, you know, Hegel or, um, you know, uh, what's the other guy, Heidegger and all these kinds mm. of, you know, philosophers. And he had some he had some cool things to say now and again or an interesting way of putting things. But he himself, I, I would now class as almost like an outsider sort of intellectual who just he ha he did have an education, but he was he was just kind of like excited about a bunch of european philosophy that he heard about and like took lines and stuff and made a nice collage of of evangelical 
pseudo philosophizing, I would say nowadays, mm-hmm. you know, but, um, but it seemed really exciting at the time. And it was really, you know, uh, seemed like a cool way to engage like secular thought and stuff <laughs> like that. <laughs> and there's, there's, there's a few times on the monster of Jesus where I, I'm, I'm really directly referencing Schaefer, although mm. I don't think I can think of examples right off the top of my head, but, um, okay. yeah, so, so Schaefer, and then, you know, I was probably reading some standard Christian apologetic stuff like um, uh, Norm Geisler, <laughs> if you've ever heard of him and stuff. I think so. And then William Lane Craig, you know, yeah. would, come in, would come into it. Yeah, of course, you know, and um, more and more I would get into the guys that that were, you know, came through the, the proper channels of academia and stuff, you know, even if now I still wouldn't buy into a lot of their philosophizing and ideas and stuff. Um, but yeah, so I was just kind of trying my teeth on a bunch of that kind of stuff. Oh, Walker Percy was was pretty big on my radar right around the time of the monster who ate Jesus. I didn't understand what I was reading, um, but I was loving it. And I don't know if you've ever heard of his Lost in the Cosmos book. Yeah, another um, name, but it's a trip. Um, mm-hmm. It's 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 all this sort of like um, semiotic mm-hmm. and existentialist philosophy, um, and just trying to like say here's how life looks meaningless but it's meaningful mm. uh and catholic you know <laughs> like thrown mm-hmm. in like <laughs> yeah and whatever and, like, yeah. and then he's like saying really weird lines in there like this guy said to an older woman in a hotel i want to take you back to the room and fuck you i don't want to nurse you i want to fuck your brains out and like <laughs> like that's like literally the language in the book always going huh. building this case toward like the truth of catholic christianity and stuff <laughs> it's like, it's fascinating so wow so I was, I was reading quite a quite a mishmash of like kind of conservative to middle to maybe just touching on some more progressive type stuff and whatever and yeah just trying all kinds of stuff. You know? So somewhere in all of this, there were monsters. <laughs> there was a lot of this imagery, uh, you know. I because I'm not I, I'm I'm hearing you you know talk about all the apologetics and the philosophy and the theology. Uh, where did, where did this interest in monsters start? When did that okay. first come into play? That's a good point. <laughs> okay. So that's actually more the foundation that that's from childhood. That's like, I mean, as early as I can remember really little, just if, if, uh, especially, uh, I don't know why this is what I remember. It's probably just all I was allowed to see or something, but a black and white horror movie, you know, the classics of, uh, you know, Dracula and Frankenstein and whatever would come on, I was just knocked off my feet. And my parents would laugh, not like not laugh at me, but like they thought it found it amusing. Like this kid is obsessed with <laughs> monsters, you know, like because they you know, they came on and the early Godzilla and anything that came on like that, I was just just it just took over my whole imagination. There's a lot of science fiction in there too. And again, weirdly, I don't they must have aired a lot of this stuff you know in the midwest at that time or something but there was like really old black and white buck rogers and flash gordon and stuff i can remember watching that kind of stuff plus the the new the 80s buck rogers and um anything sci-fi you know i was in of course star wars and all that i was just totally besotted with science fiction and horror and and fantasy and stuff like that so um yeah so i just kind of loved that stuff and, and i can remember my mom reading where the wild things are out loud to me. So I was young enough that I needed read out loud to me and just being like, I'm Max, you know, that's me. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I, I, I make the the monsters dance, you know, <laughs> the wild rumpus and all that, you know? And so I just identified with that kind of thing very early on. That's just like my whole imagination. Um, and even literarily, weirdly, I read um, the screw tape letters around like, age 12 or something. Wow. I think my dad had handed it to me and said, you might find this interesting. And I, again, I didn't really understand a word of it, but it, I loved the thought that there was like this demon right into another demon about trying to tempt a human. And I took it almost like as a horror story. I was like, oh, this is oh, so yeah. creepy. I was like, even kind of freaked out by it. Like, you know, yeah. like, um, and I also weirdly at that, at an early age before that, even I w- had started reading Edgar Allan Poe and, and that, just really stuck with me and that's what i always say if if i have to be honest and say where my first language comes from when i like think 
to write or try to make an image. It's really a combination of C.S. Lewis and Edgar Allan Poe, which is mm. so weird for a little Midwestern kid <laughs> who doesn't come from any kind of educational background or anything like that. You know, it's just like, but I just like none of those things. And then I loved heavy metal and punk and skating and whatever, you know, just kind of there was nothing off limits. I was just like, all oh, this goes in, you know, like, yeah. So, but yeah, I, so I, just, I, I was just gonna say, I can say with confidence that in junior high, those were like, two of my main dudes as well i was nice. like way into <laughs> narnia growing up but it was it was screw tape that was kind of my window into sort of the next level lewis and i totally agree i always wanted to see like a movie with a proper like demon puppet or something <laughs> like really go <laughs> yes. all in on the horror angle of yeah. that yeah. um but yeah that that common i got poe books at like a really early age from this like early readers series so i feel like those were some of the same sort of formative things for me so yeah being a a kid in the Midwest digging on sort of like <laughs> early theology and horror stuff. I, I, I'm right there with you. Nice. Yeah, I did um, read the Narnia books too. Sure, um, sure. And it was, I, I say it all went in, but the funny thing was when I went to first write songs for the first iteration of Blaster, I didn't know what to write about. And one of the first ideas was, a, was all the way to the blood bank. And mm. another one was King of the Beach. Um, mm. um and I killed the checkout girl. Those were all really early songs. So I guess it was a little bit of a variety of like a murderer, a vampire, and like Charles Atlas comics beach scene or something. But but <laughs> but but the horror theme kind of took over and it just felt like the easiest thing to write. I was like, I don't know what to write about. And I just like had a head full of monsters and stuff. So I was like, <laughs> there you go. And then I was like a good evangelical Christian that needed to gear all that towards something. <laughs> yes. Head full Sounds of funny. monsters is that is that <laughs> like is an autobiography a, title or something. Yeah, right. <laughs> an like autobiography. Mm, <laughs> auto. Um, yeah, I. I mean, could you talk us through like the conception of the band a little bit? Did you always want to start a band? Did you always want to start a Christian horror punk band? Like, did it begin as a rock opera? I heard that. <laughs> yeah. uh, that was uh, yeah. That became a big legend. Um, yeah. So I, I guess I wanted to, I started fantasizing about starting bands around 14 or something. And I would keep these, no, I, w I wish I had them now so bad. They'd be the most various thing, but I would make entire bands, like uh, make up a band name and then like two to five albums worth of track listings for, <laughs> with the song titles <laughs> for Amazing. multiple bands. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Yeah, and it was mostly heavy metal stuff. It was really into thrash and stuff, and so it was like geared around that. And it was all, all this kind of spiritual warfare type, stuff, whatever. And yeah, so that was like, and that was just that was just something I did. I actually didn't think I would be in a band. Or I was just a pastime, and I, I never liked school, and I couldn't do my work, and I couldn't concentrate, and I would just make those, those lists and stuff instead. But um, and then uh, sixteen maybe or so somebody asked me to, to to sing like a punk song like sort of a hardcore punk type style to a little guitar riff they made me t just taped it on a little tape recorder and i just shouted out these lyrics <laughs> as hard as i could and i was like oh i didn't realize you can just like do that like i was like okay and what they weren't so much vocal inspirations as performance inspirations were mike not if you're familiar with mike yeah. not because i'd seen lsu one of his bands play live quite a few times and he was just so theatrical and, and insane, I mean, insane, off the charts, weird, rubbing stuff all over him. But he poured a whole thing of, of a cafeteria sized thing of cream of corn all over him at one gig. <laughs> and I was just like, you are, you are it. This is the gold standard, you know, it was, it was him and, and Mike Patton from Faith No More and Mr. Bungle and all mm. that. Those two sure. guys, just the, the energy they had and the way they performed and stuff. And I was like, and I told myself, I was like, I can't sing. I'm not really a singer, but I can do that. I can go nuts. I'll just do that. You know? And so then I, then I started to dream of actually starting a band and, and, and managed to get one going eventually with my brother and some friends and stuff. So, and, yeah. and, and the blaster thing was, I just, I showed them a list of names the very first time we had a practice and they all just went, forget everything it's blaster the rocket boy that's the one you know and i had and i and that did come from this those lists of albums i made one of them as i was transitioning into punk was blaster the rocket boy a punk rock opera and i mm. think it maybe made a few notes for it or something and maybe sure. some song titles and that's it and it's long lost i don't remember any of it 
but yeah, it was an idea for a punk rock opera called Blaster the Rocket Boy. <laughs> so, mm. I, still time. We should make that happen. <laughs> was was everybody on board with the the horror angle of it? Was that something that like you brought and everybody was equally excited about? I mean, what was that? How did that sort of deciding on a, a theme go? Uh, they just left it up to me. Okay. <laughs> they just they just wanted to play songs and i think sure. they they liked the vibe and we were we wanted you know it, there was always a lot of tongue-in-cheek i mean we wanted to be funny not just like a comedy band but we wanted to be funny as well as intense or whatever and they were like yeah cool vampires and stuff let's do it you know and then it, <laughs> and then it just became a huge obsession for me and i had by that time i probably wouldn't have I wouldn't have allowed anybody to change it. I got, you know, ego, egocentric and be like, no, this is, this is what we're all about. You know, and everything. Um, but yeah, thankfully yeah. They, they didn't really care. They just wanted to play the music and um, yeah. And then I, I would kind of, I would just throw a whole bunch of styles at them, you know, let's, let's have a bit of misfits, a bit of cramps, a bit of this, you know, and, let, and for a particular song, kind of this kind of vibe or that kind of vibe. And then, and then my brother got more and more interested in all kinds of stuff like swing and, and, and country and, and different things. And, and he would throw that in. I'd be like, yes, that sounds good. Let's do that too. You know, I'm like, you know, I'm like um, so yeah, he, he, uh, I th- it was kind of 50, 50 with musical influence for, for quite a while. And then, and then we both just kind of like let each other just fully take over. Just like, I, nobody's going to think about the lyrics or the vocals, just do that. And nobody's going to think about the music and stuff. Just do that. We trust each other and, and just do that. Sure. So something that we discussed in this last month with a variety of bands is this sort of, uh, is this band, is the, the whole like horror monster thing, is it contrived just to like for the aesthetic or is it authentic? And we unequivocally with you guys were like, oh, this is like the real deal. Um, but and also one of the things that we uh, and, and the same thing with like Joe um, from Harley Poe, just very mm-hmm. clearly into into the, that aesthetic. Um, and one of the things that we we wrestled with with um, with Harley Poe and and just I, I'm curious about um, in this this scene, which is a very unfamiliar scene to me, uh, this this horror punk Christian <laughs> scene. Um, like where, uh, how do you kind of like blend these two concepts? I'm sure that there was like maybe some, some pushback and where, where is the, do you see that there is like a balance between being like, you know, grisly sort of murder ballads and, and also like talking about Jesus? Like, how do you, (laughs) how do you, how did you find yourself to blend these concepts? Um, yeah, that's a great question. And I think, I think, um, again, a lot of it just, this is my defense towards some of the cringiness, <laughs> but, and, and also, uh, it, but it also takes a little bit out of the whole savant thing, if I admit this too, but it was just very intuitive for me. It just kind of came out that way. A ton mm-hmm. of it did. I, I say I was being a good evangelical. I was, but it was, it was more from the heart. It wasn't like a planned, like, okay, now, how can I make this a Sunday school lesson? You know, it just sure, kind of right. was just, just happening. And um, I would say that I do think those earlier, the earlier influence of like C.S. Lewis and then Flannery O'Connor did already make that pretty natural to me to, to like weave together theology and the grotesque or, hmm. you know, straight up sort of evangelizing or, 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 or evangelical sort of themes with, um, you know, uh, horror, just a whole horror, the, like the genre, you know, the genre of horror or the, or the mode of, of horror and the grotesque and the monstrous and stuff. Um, so I, I don't know, if, you know, how, how familiar you guys are, are with Flannery O'Connor, but um, mm-hmm. Yeah, people, you know, it's, it's called Southern Gothic and stuff, you know, and people do call it grotesque and sometimes call it horror and stuff like that. And, and I, and people critique her too about almost being too, um, sometimes bringing in the Catholic worldview almost too obviously or in a pat way or something, but at her mm-hmm. best, I think she just all comes out very, very enmeshed and, and quite 
um, complex in a way that you kind of have to unpick and try to understand what's going on and stuff. So I think, you know, I do think I had some precedents already in my imagination of how sure. these things these things could naturally be expressed. I forgot another huge influence at the, at the time of the monster. Age. He's a, such a funny one. I'm such a weirdo. What a weird kid. I <laughs> love John Milton's Paradise Lost. And I mean, like I read it. I read like that 400 page poem, you know, mm -hmm. several times with underlining and stuff. And I just thought his, his language was amazing. And there's obviously the whole Satan is so, almost a, the protagonist, at least for half of it. Um, there's some like intense scenes of like hell i think is personified uh with like an open womb with monsters coming out or something and all kinds of you know just i don't know just i can't even remember nowadays i haven't read it in so long but um even i was i was actually really liked um uh what's his name john john bunyan did pilgrim's progress yeah yeah, the frontier right. guy, John Bunyan. <laughs> but yeah, Pilgrim's Progress. And it has yeah. some some pretty cool fantastical imagery and a bit of horror monster type stuff here and there. So, and I think I was already cluing in by that time too. I didn't really, I didn't do my whole theology of monsters things till a little, maybe a little after the monster who ate Jesus, but I was already cluing in, cluing into the fact that the Bible had monsters in it, you know, in the in some of the prophetic books of the Old Testament and the book of Revelation and different things like that, just monstrous apocalyptic imagery. But they were like, you know, giant beings with multiple animal body parts. Between Flannery O'Connor, you know, C.S. Lewis, uh, John Milton, the Bible, it felt really natural to talk about those kinds of things together. And then you kind of easily found your way into things like blood, you know, the blood sure, of Christ sure. and, yeah. and whatever, you know. So again, I have to say it was more intuitive than like, a, here's a plan you know, yeah, uh, theology of monsters or, or a way to use this kind of imagery evangelically or something like that. Sure. Um, it felt comfortable for me. There was some pushback now and again, maybe if, even a few letters, I think, of people going, why would you do this? That's satanic imagery or whatever, <laughs> you know. Um, not much, but a little bit. Um, but most, and most people I felt kind of misinterpreted it too for, for what I thought at the time, although I like their interpretations now, but <laughs> you'll have noticed how consistently you did notice when you did the monster Eight jesus i would use monsters kind of as symbols of like sin and stuff um mm. and sometimes people would be like oh i love the way you use you liken christians to vampires and werewolves feeding on christ and stuff like that and i was like no that's the people come that are coming to christ and then they get healed of that or whatever you know that kind of thing and i was a little when i did think about it and after the intuitive thing was already done and I thought about it, like, it was like, it was a kind of a strict system <laughs> mm. of like making sure that monsters stood for sin and stuff like that, even though it was so clear how much I loved monsters, you know, right. yeah. but I needed them to fit that kind of pigeonhole. Sure. And, and that would only develop a little more over time, a little bit in the second band, but th then more so after music and everything where I don't see monsters in a binary sort of like they're, they represent, evil sort of way and i agree yeah. with you guys 100 percent about the whole werewolves thing they're hard, <laughs> they're hard done by by christian horror punk <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's it's funny that that became like uh our ongoing sort of like justice for werewolves uh segment <laughs> during the show but i think i mean it kind of became this thing that was a little bit of a discussion within our uh like patreon discord as some folks were saying like well i mean that metaphor has been used for centuries. It's not like unique to, you know, yeah. Christian bands from the nineties that, you know, monsters yeah. often stand in for yeah. sin or for things we can't control. And we'll get to mm -hmm. this in a little bit with your, with your work around, um, you know, monstrous uh, elements and how that incorporates with theology and stuff like that. Um, but for me, I guess I, I'm always drawn to stories where the ghost or the monster or whatever, there's, there's a tragic element obviously baked into mm -hmm. that, but like, when you have empathy for them and when there's like something sympathetic about the monster's plight, I feel like that's what I'm most sort of drawn in. Um, and so, you know, obviously I understand like there's, there's an easy uh, metaphor to be had there in terms of like, we can't control our sin, but I'm also like, but I like the idea that uh, these monsters are also nuanced figures sometimes. <laughs> so, yeah. so that's kind of where I was coming from with my werewolf defense, but I don't know. How <laughs> yeah, totally. And I mean, like I was coming, you know, I did think, like a lot of times as the you said the people pointed out you know that 
it's often like if you're a vampire, you're a werewolf, you've been cursed. That's like right. in the mythos. Yeah. And I thought, oh, the Bible uses curse language, you know, perfect, yeah. you know, and like that kind of thing. But again, more on an intuitive level. But but as I thought about it, I was like, yeah, that all that all checks out, you know. Yeah. Um, but it's funny because I always sympathized with the monster as a mm. kid on, on a lot of levels. And I really liked those ones that had a lot of pathos to them you know, um, where you felt that for them in the movie and stuff and tragic figures and Frankenstein and whatever. And, you know, this, I would say to go into a deep end moment for a second here, I would say that's a bit of the, the toxicity of evangelical culture is that I really did think that I was being empathetic with sure. these sinful monsters yeah, and yeah. that I was offering them love, you know, yeah. and compassion and, and redemption you know not from me but you know just like saying it's there you know there's hope or whatever you know and and i was taking that childhood love of the monster and sympathy with the monster and thinking that i was um offering you know extending that to these monsters but the the um the kind of rigid theology that that had to fit into i didn't realize at the time but almost um <clears throat> I was guess I'm not sure what the best term is. It definitely kind of counteracted it or subverted it, undermined it, undermined that sympathy. Mm. I almost said it gaslit that sympathy, but that's not quite maybe the quite the right uh, term use of the word gaslit. But mm. there's definitely gaslighting in evangelical culture. But, um, but yeah, so yeah, it's just uh, that, that that's that's what I find toxic about it is that you think from the bottom of your heart you're doing something so good and compassionate. And there is a lot of compassion there. And there is, you know, there are good people and well-meaning people, but there's something inherently in some of the theology that just is always going to hurt people. Mm. And um, that's what you're handing to them when you think you're doing it. And you don't see it. You don't notice it. It's so so insidious and stuff. So, yeah. 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 I mean, it's when you're an evangelical comes up to somebody and repeatedly says, you're a sinner, you're going to hell. In their mind, they're like, I'm literally saving you. What's the problem? <laughs> but, yeah, you know, when yeah, you're a- yeah. outside of that way of thinking, you're like, I'm just like trying to go about my my day and you're telling me how awful I am and how I deserve hell, you know? So, yeah, there's the, – there it's it's baked in like you're saying it's baked in that's a great way to put it. it's baked in and the the other way you tried to get around it that i tried to do with a lot of the lyrics from time to time is i was you say you're the sinner. you're like i'm a sinner i'm the monster i've done these monsters you know and you know initially i was singing in the album before i am an american werewolf you know and i was right. likening my own sin to being a werewolf you know and then I don't know how I got into a pointer finger, finger pointing mode with it. I like like cancer I'm not sure what happened there. Um, sure. And it was such a ruined, like it was, I was clearly also just celebrating. I was like, I like like cancer like, <laughs> yeah, 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 totally. So, you know, this is what that means. You know? But, <laughs> but, um, yeah. but yeah, you try to, you try to say, no, no, we're all sinners. We're all monsters. We're all under the curse. And, you know, and, you know, I'm just, Another, you know, the things they say, like, just another beggar telling another beggar where to get food and all that, you mm-hmm. know, you try to be humble about it and stuff, but it, it, there's still something uh, not so great baked into it. So. Sure. Yeah. No, I, I mean, American Werewolf does kind of provide a, a sort of counter to the werewolf uh, experience and how it's <laughs> how it's presented through theology in some ways, which is a, a sentence nobody's <laughs> ever said before. Um, but that song absolutely rules. Um, you know, when you were talking about it's perceived as a curse. Um, it just, just a quick aside. Have you seen uh, Midnight Mass at all? The Netflix show? I'm about, I want to say five episodes in. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I feel like it's very along those lines, right? Like oh. what one, what, what a, what a faith, uh, you know, in this case, like Catholicism or Christianity can perceive as uh, a blessing can be an obvious curse and vice versa, you know? So yeah. anyway, I just, it seems, seems along your, 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 your lines, the things that you like. Yeah, I'm very curious how they're going to resolve the sort of theological tensions that they've set up with that show. But it's really fun. It's a really cool approach, yeah. just getting right out there with, you know, the, the spiritual theological imagery and, and monsters. And, yeah, yeah tackling it, them out. it has an ending that I think is fascinating. So eventually I'd love to hear your take cool. on that. But anyway, <laughs> we can move on from that. Well, before we get too far away from I Like Lycanthropy, you know, I, I there were there was all kinds of discussion on the pod off the pod about 
uh, what that what the werewolves actually were kind of representing in in that song. And I was curious, you know, I don't I don't always like necessarily asking uh, musicians to explain themselves when it comes to what lyrics mean. But, you know, since you did give us, you know, carte blanche to ask you about mm-hmm. lyrics, I got to know like what uh, what that song is actually about because I, I I don't want to keep speculating. Okay, I'm gonna give I'm gonna give everybody the juicy gossip on this one and just tell the 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 cold hard truth about this song. So yes, I had homosexuals in mind definitely. Um, I was riffing on uh, a bum- a bumper sticker at the time that said I think hate maybe is not a family value, and then it had like a pride flag or I think the one I saw was from some lesbian co-workers who I really liked and they liked me um, <laughs> um, and it had the pink triangle. But yeah, so I was kind of riffing on on that. The, the thing I will say is that <clears throat> it only came up as, as an example to me. The whole song is not about homosexuality or that mm. or, or even sexual sin or something. It's about sin, you know, and sinners. And that that one example unfortunately as i thought at the time of of sin and right, being a right. sinner um <clears throat> was you know came to my mind and kind of sparked some of the ideas um but i really when i said you know don't call it a curse um how's that go the wolfman is back don't call it a curse sticker on my car read and weep for the ones you love says equal rights for werewolves yeah i can't believe i can remember that that's amazing <laughs> um, <laughs> uh but uh I really was by that point, you know, the metaphor had come in a bit from from some homosexual uh, sort of um, uh, or some pride sort of culture. Um, but I, I really meant it as like a general like anybody who tries to excuse their sin is just the way they are or something, you know, is uh, isn't seeing reality and they're missing their own problem and the solution in Christ and that kind of thing. So, so yes, it, it was spawned a little bit, but, and I, I, the funny thing is I I had no agenda about that kind of stuff. I didn't think a lot about homosexuality. I wasn't like, Oh, that's what's wrong with the world today. Or like, uh, (laughs) yeah, I just really wasn't that on my mind. And, and I, uh, that, like that little idea came in there and I kind of riffed on that. And then I was talking about sin in general. And I would say within, this is the truth, within about a year, I'd say after that album came out, I regretted it. <laughs> I was like, mm. oh, why is that? No, I don't like that. I, why did I do that? Oh, that's not, ah. Oh. And I remember somebody interviewed me while I was, when I first moved to Scotland, somebody from the States, um, somebody's like teacher or something that had done a paper on on uh, Blaster. And he was like, oh, that sounds cool. I want to interview. And he asked me point blank about that and stuff. And so, and I said, look, I would never write, and this was like 2002 or something. I was like, I would, I regret writing that. I would never write that kind of thing. Now, I don't think that's a, that's a very compassionate way to talk about things. And it's just doesn't really listen to people and like where they're coming from and stuff. And like, so yeah, it didn't take me long to, to regret it and be like, Whoa, that was, that was weird. But, but that's again, part of that toxicity where you, you almost feel you're doing something quite spiritual and good to, mm-hmm. to say something bold and confrontational about sin or something, you know, and you think you're offering compassion and you guys pointed out, I can't believe you guys went all the way into things like the missing, the mysteriously missing third verse. I'd forgotten that even existed. <laughs> like, <laughs> thank you for bringing up, bringing that up, digging that up for me. Um, and again, when you guys read it out, I was like, and the way you guys were hearing it, we're like, yeah, it's a good thing they didn't put that. That's I was like, I thought that was so like compassionate or something, you know, mm, to, to like sure. kind of portray these this monster that is being shown compassion but still wants to eat the the one showing them compassion or whatever. And but it's just it just starts from such absolutely abysmal premises, you know, of, of saying the way someone is born is like <laughs> somehow connected to curse or sin or something. And mm, um, sure that it's uh it's just toxic you know (laughs) yeah i mean that's that's something that's come up so frequently for us on the show is hearing from artists who you know now sort of regret these things that are put on record and and frozen in amber for for decades um but what we try to remind folks is like that wasn't like you you or other artists were coming up with that in a silo like that was the culture that was saying these are the things that 
we need to be focusing on if we want to save people. And so, I, you know, I'm just, just the reminder that like with the cringe elements comes the, well, those were the things that at the time with, with culture wars and things were being so emphasized, uh, yeah. especially in evangelical circles. So, yeah. um, but you know, if there's, so, you know, we get, we give you a chance to address the, the, maybe the cringier elements, but on the other side of that, are there, what are, what are sort of songs or, um, you know, albums or experiences you had in the band that you look back and you're like proudest of, or that you are most, um, excited about, uh, thinking about again, when you, when you look back on it? Mm. Well, if you, you don't have to put this on the podcast, if you want, if you don't want to, but just before we move on to, on to that, I would like to say that, um, you can make me make this bonus content or something. <laughs> okay. I, I, I would sincerely apologize to anyone who ever heard that and, and thought, you know, that that did address them as a homosexual or something. And to anyone learning it now, you know, I would very sincerely apologize for that. And I'm sorry mm. I was ever part of that kind of toxic mm. culture and stuff and, and, and uh, contributing to people's ill mental health. And I, out of my five children, four out of five all identify as LGBTQ plus, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, including trans and, and so on. So, um, you know, and I don't even know how many, of, I know some of the older kids know about some of these old lyrics, you know, and they mm. are, they try to be kind and gracious about it <laughs> Sure. <laughs> and kind of laugh along with me about, Oh my gosh, the cringe, you know, but yeah, um, but yeah you know, so, so it, it's, thanks it's for sharing that. That hits home, you know, and and, yeah. and that I care about, and I'm very much on the opposite side of that issue now. So yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm sure that's meaningful for for people to hear and for us to hear. So thank you. Yeah. Um. So what I'm proud of, um, I I do really love the album The Monster Ate Jesus. I think musically and stuff, um, that's the one I can listen to again every once in a while and be like, wow, that's that's really cool. We made a a good album, and I, and I am shocked that that kind of new fans like you guys or oh, not to call fans but you know new no, listeners come along. <laughs> for sure for sure fans. <laughs> new listeners come along every once in a while are like oh have you heard of this blaster group and this monster hate jesus album and i'm like that's amazing that people are still discovering it uh that that much later um and i do like that album and can i've occasionally tried to put a song on a, like a spotify list like um human fly trap i think you guys put that in your top three i really do mm -hmm, like did, that yeah. song I, I haven't, yeah. I haven't, I meant to make my own top three and I forgot, I forgot Ooh. to do that. But human flytrap yeah. might go in there. Um, Hell yeah. But uh, yeah. And I can like hear it. I'll, I'll, I'll hear my mix with some, you know, cramps and rocket from the crypt and misfits and whatever. And then this blaster song will come on and I, I might not even recognize it for a bar or two. And I'm like, Oh, that kind of fits. Okay. You know, like that's <laughs> half halfway almost kind of fits in here, you know, and I'm like, yeah, have a nice little moment. So yeah, I like that album. I like, you know, bits and pieces of, uh, of the earlier albums. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think the lyrics, sometimes I do hear some of the lyrics and think, um, yeah, it's not bad, not bad writing it's just for a kid who didn't know what he was doing. And, you know, just, just, just trying this stuff out. And um, especially when it didn't go into blatant Jesus territory, <laughs> it kind of yeah. held together better. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I don't know if I, if I can, you know, I, 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 we generally played pretty good live shows. I mean, we could be like most bands, we could be kind of hit and miss. Maybe we weren't practiced enough or we had new members coming in and out and we couldn't, you know, perform as well as we'd like. But when we were on, we were really on and, and like, you know, we, we made a mess of things. We broke things. We, <laughs> didn't get paid because we broke things and you know <laughs> and, and you know everybody had a really great time and people would come to the front to make sure that I spat dog biscuits on them when I used to spit dog biscuits on the crowd and stuff like that um oh. and yeah you know we had a we, we were known for a good live show and that you know good stage presence and all that kind of stuff at least when we were at our best and I'm That's proud right. of that and that was fun and, and and all that kind of thing um so, you know, and we had, we did, we did, because we kept ourselves intentionally off of tooth and nail and stuff like that. We, we were on that mm -hmm. one sampler and we had to sign this gigantic contract just to be on the sampler. And that, that alone put me right off. I was like, this is just some weird corporate thing that I don't mm -hmm. want to be involved with. And so we kept ourselves kind of underground and everything. And I actually think through that, we, we did have some crossover fandom. I mean, there were, especially in the Midwest and stuff, there were 
a lot of just scene kids that aren't into Christian music at all are like, oh, we love you guys, I love Blaster and stuff like that, you know, and hmm. that kind of thing. So I'm kind of glad we could kind of cross over that way and stuff. But yeah, that's all I can really think of is just kind of some, we did make some good music and it does have some continuing impact and um, it was fun. And, you know, we got to tour a little bit and stuff like that and put on some good shows. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you were talking about the context of the Midwest and sort of staying underground in part by um you know sort of being being in that having that be your scene what one thing that we noticed was like so many of these horror punk bands christian horror punk bands that we covered during that month were from indiana and yeah. for the most part a lot of the bands were covering you know from the christian punk world was like west coast largely west coast some east mm-hmm. coast but not very much mm-hmm. midwest but all of a sudden with the spooky stuff it was like Indiana was the hotspot. So do you have any like <laughs> thoughts on, I mean, what was it like being in Indianapolis as you're seen? Did you feel yeah. like there's something about that world that sort of breeds uh, outside of the box uh, bands like that? Yeah. Or yeah. What do you think about that? Well, first of all, I was just so pleased to hear you guys zero in on it. And I hadn't even quite fully clocked it myself. And, I, and so Indiana is the kind of place you come from and you don't like it. And most people <laughs> that I know who are into punk and stuff have moved away and glad they moved away and everything. But I moved away sort of early enough to then look back on it wistfully. And now I, mm-hmm. and I still think it's like, it is the most dull Midwestern state, even Illinois comes kind of close, but <laughs> it's at least got Chicago, you know, right. but like places like Minnesota and Wisconsin, there's something you probably think, ah, oh, we're just the Midwest, but it's way better than Indiana. Like Indiana <laughs> genuinely is just flat strip yeah. malls and cornfields and nothing yes. else. And like, and the culture is largely dull and just, it's just, it's nowhere America is what I call it. And, hmm. um, but I now can appreciate a whole lot of stuff about it and see its own kind of weird charm in its flat. I mean, I miss, believe it or not, I live in a very hilly place now, a very mountainy, hilly place. And I miss flatness sometimes. Sometimes I like get freaked out by too many hills. I'm like, I just sure. see further. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, and it's, and, and Indiana isn't even epically flat the way, you know, I don't know, Montana or Wyoming or something is, you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. it's just flat. It's just kind of flat, you know? But um, so, yeah. So, I do kind of like Indiana in a nostalgic tongue in cheek sort of way now. So it's kind of fun to be like, Oh yeah, Indiana is being noticed as the place that bred all this horror punk or whatever. (laughs) I do think I remember at the time, I remember at the time when we first started making the music and we started being like, we want to do surf. We want to do punk old school and a little bit of new school and um, mix in some country and whatever. And I remember thinking at the time, this is so Midwest. This is so Indiana. Like mm-hmm. we are not cool. We 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 could never do all that West Coast East Coast stuff. They everybody's tight. They have a tight style. They both visually and musically, and they they just they're locked in. They've got traditions. They've got you know a whole scene behind them with all these classics and greats, and and you know they're just and they're so authentic. And we're just like you know like nerds who, who who like punk rock and like just um yeah we just can't com- compete with all that and we and we didn't have like a pure line of music that we were into we were like oh i like this i like that i like including you know nirvana and whatever was coming down the pike and you know and everything and we're just like yeah yeah let's do all that stuff and i see it here in in middle um scotland it's it's actually quite similar um but and i think middle type places are like that where there's these scenes of like the metal kids and the punk kids and the maybe even the hip-hop kids and the whoever like all kind of hang out together because there's not enough of them to form separate scenes and stuff you know and so there's all this cross-pollination and i remember thinking like it's hilarious that I called us like corn surf or something like that at one point. Like, cause it's like, why are we playing surf music? We're surrounded by cornfields. So like, Screw it. You know, that's just, yeah. Yeah. So I think it does breed like a goofy, naive sort of um, uh, creativity and willingness to like experiment and mix and match and just mash up stuff. Um, uh, because we're, you know, uh, we can't help it. We're kind of, we're, you know, in the middle and, and we don't know what's going on in the cool places until they're not cool anymore and stuff like that. And then you, you, if you, if you can, you come to a place where you embrace that and you're like, ah, oh, this is hilarious. We're the, <laughs> we're the, the hicks. 
that's kind okay. of awesome. Let's just like lean into that, you know, <laughs> and make weird stuff, you know? So, but why some of it comes out as horror and stuff is, I don't know, maybe, you know, Stephen King latched onto that a long time ago with, you know, children of the corn and whatever, just sort of like right. cor cornfields are creepy. And you know, yeah, <laughs> enough of that flat space just kind of creeps you out and think of monsters. And stuff. Sure. Uh, that makes sense. That works for me. Yeah, there's always there's something lurking behind, you know, the tall grass, the tall yeah. corn, you know. Yes. That is that is creepy. Um, so where where in Scotland are you? I'm in Glasgow. Um, okay. It's kind of Edinburgh is the capital, right. but Glasgow's the biggest city. Um, and those are they're kind of rival cities. Um, but it's it's sort of in the middle. There's the highlands with all the mountains and stuff up top, and then there's the lowlands which have like hills and stuff, very pretty. Yes. And then there's the middle sort of industrial belt of like Glasgow and Edinburgh and stuff. It still has some really pretty stuff in it too, but it's more urban and, and what have you. Scotland is at the top of my list of places I want to visit. Uh, it, it just has always struck me as just stunning. And that, and I am an enormous Scotch fan and mm -hmm. I just want to go and, sit on a hill somewhere and and pour myself a dram and a Glencairn yeah. glass and just yeah. cry looking at the water you know that's yeah. <laughs> that yeah that well th this is a good place to come and do that <laughs> and it, it will be very rainy and and grim and <laughs> and uh you know yeah it'll it, it works for that um sitting outside on in the heather you know sipping whiskey yeah. Uh, yeah. You, you know, <laughs> visit the distilleries and all that kind of stuff. It's great for that. It's a great place to, to visit. And it, and when, when the sun shines for a minute or two here and there, you'll see glorious vistas if you go up north or whatever. And it's, uh, it's epic and amazing. Um, yeah. You know, it's everyday life is like anywhere, you know, sure, <laughs> it's sure. like there's, there's all kinds of cultural things that are not, it's not like everybody's just wistfully Scottishly romantic here or something, you know, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. You know right all the norm there's like all the crappy mainstream cheese and you know annoying <laughs> stuff and there's the there's the just down and out just really rough stuff and you know there's everything in between and all kinds of other stuff and the rich people and poor people and the whatever you know and like just the all the, the the big mess that life is it's all here you know <laughs> but yeah it's it's a great place it's really cool in its way i was thinking about that scene in uh train spotting which was a movie and book i was way into growing up where they're like out looking at the vistas and he's like isn't it amazing to live there and they're all like it's shite being scottish it's awful yeah. <laughs> anyway so i'm sure both of those things live together in tension uh, yeah. Um, yeah i love but, that uh, scene. <laughs> yeah so good um but you know talking about moving into sort of glasgow uh from indiana talking about voice of the mysterons like how did you what did you want that project to be compared to what you did as blaster and sort of how did that how did that come together hmm. Well, um, Dougal was kind of the driving force. Dougal, his stage name is still Dougal McMisteron. <laughs> um, That's awesome. But I think his name, funnily enough, he's a friend of mine, but I do forget his name all the time. Um, Ross McDonald, I think is his name. Ross something. <laughs> um, <laughs> but he, his friends long ago started calling him Dougal. Um, <clears throat> but he's a giant. You may have met him. I don't know, because he's been to the States and been to Cornerstone Festival. And stuff, but yeah, he's this, I don't know, six foot four, um, big giant chops hanging off his face and long hair and a big dirty Scottish guy um, <laughs> who's hilarious and full of full of banter and what have you. But um, he, he asked me to, he had a little instrumental band called Voice of the Mistrons, uh, which is, I don't know if you know, that's from a TV show. Yeah. Right. Um, Wait, which Captain, one again? <laughs> is it yes. Captain Scarlet or something? Or, uh, Anyway, the bad guys are called the Mistrons, and they're right. like, this is the voice of the Mistron. Uh, I didn't Captain really Scarlet know. and the Mistrons, yes. Yeah, I, I didn't know about that at the time. Um, okay. I had seen Thunderbirds, which is the same kind of animation type thing. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, so they the name came with it, you know, and they were like, we're making these little instrumentals, and they asked me to like do like a spoken word thing over one of them. And to be honest, I kind of just took over the band. I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> why don't I just do vocals for all your songs, you know? <laughs> and, and they, you know, and Dougal had, you know, liked Blaster, was a fan of Blaster and stuff. So he did know of my work and stuff. And um, so uh, so they, they went for it and they just, you know, they just made this crazy sort of um, like 
uh, prog metal punk sort of <laughs> music that I just figured out a way to throw a bunch of lyrics into. And I got, I got super into like writing long, 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 long involved lyrics with long, long titles and stuff. <laughs> um, and I think that that was the only difference is I wanted to, uh, you know, and I, I even cringe at some of these aspirations now, but I, I wanted to sort of uh, stretch and expand as a, as a lyricist, you know, and be more poetic and whatever, I don't know. Um, and was trying to kind of do that a little bit intellectually and theologically, but I don't think, ultimately, I think it made a lot of lyrics sound better overall. Um, and, and hopefully I don't think go into too much or any, really cringy territory but some of the baseline theology is quite similar so i don't i don't i didn't i'd have to go back and look through all the different lyrics but i didn't get too far with finally getting out of monsters being kind of a symbol of, of sin or something like that i think i was more i was getting close to monsters if they had a sin element being able to be transformed and still be monsters that's mm -hmm. that was i was definitely getting there <laughs> sure um, which is more where I would be at nowadays, if if there if there's even any kind of transformation needed. Um, but some monsters need transformation. I mean, if you think of if you, people call Trump a monster and stuff, you know, and sure, you don't want to extend grace to some of these monsters, but they could you know receive it and change or whatever. But right. um, but yeah, so so that was the only real difference. I just I wanted to keep kind of doing monsters and stuff, but in a, a more lyrically robust way or something, and just. Mm. Uh, not be limited to sort of you know vampires and werewolves and that kind of thing and just kind of I don't know riff a lot on I don't even know what what my inspiration was or what I think I was kind of making up monsters and stuff I'd, I'd really have to go back and look at those lyrics I haven't thought about those in quite a while hmm. so it was kind of a convenient it was just a band of convenience you know I just like saw an opportunity to create with some guys and just started going for it um, hmm. yeah yeah the I love the long names which we touched on mm -hmm. a little bit on mm -hmm. the, on the pod but they're just like yeah close encounters of the ominous ape cat a contemplative nocturne useful for passing sleepless midnights it's just outstanding <laughs> just, so, just i love it every time you read that out i love it because i remember thinking that was so fun at the time and then reading it later and being like oh like, that's just, it's just too long and too involved and it's kind of cheesy you think you're being fun but what, every time you say it out i'm like yeah that's it that's how it should sound it's, it's serious and it's like so great <laughs> so i'm so into it and it's not too far off from the kind of stuff that a lot of scene bands in the early 2000s were were doing mm -hmm. a lot of uh metalcore bands and even like i think of bands like uh fallout boy or you know panic at the disco we're doing like those long song titles and stuff mm. like that so um i'm i think it, it it works and i think it's i think it's funny and and creative <laughs> um but i mean that's not you know too far off from you know what you ended up doing with <laughs> your academic your academic yeah. writing um John, did you want to, I, I don't know, I didn't want to like move too quickly. No, no, I, I, I was going to say the same thing. If you want a long title. Yeah, yeah, John, uh, John your, hit your it. Doctoral, your doctoral thesis, if I may, is titled, You are the old and trapped dreams of the coyote's brains oozing liquid through the broken eye socket, colon, eco-monstrous poetics and weird bioregionalism in the fiction of R.A. Lafferty, parentheses, with the comparative reading of Cormac McCarthy's Blood Meridian. Uh, <laughs> There are a lot of things I like in that title. <laughs> um, could you tell us a bit about your academic focus and ideas like eco monstrous poetics and weird mm -hmm. bioregionalism? Yeah, yeah. I I sincerely never dreamed they would let me use that title. I just <laughs> I love I didn't it. Tell, I didn't tell them that was going to be my title. I had some shortened, tame, you know, eco monstrous poetics and uh -huh. or something like that that I'd been using all along. And then when it came time for the submission, that's what I put in the form. And I was like, they'll kick this back to me and go, you can't use that for a time. And they let it go through. And it's like on the <laughs> university website and stuff. I'm like, yeah. So great. <laughs> like, how many I just get a publisher to use that title? <laughs> yeah. Right. I'm just like thinking how many doctoral thesis, uh, like people have a uh, doctoral thesis with words like oozing in Ooze, it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Best. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, and the, the, the table of contents for it is full, like there's all these chapter headings and then sub chapter headings, like like 30 per chapter or something that are full of long titles like that. Many of which are quote, that's a quote from Lafferty, that oozing part and many right. of which are quotes in, in there. And it's like weird stuff and hilarious. And one of my, I had two readers and for it to examine it, two examiners, and one loved it and one hated it. And I was like, <laughs> that sounds about right. <laughs> yeah, 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 sure. <laughs> But um, yeah, so this is the funny thing about the, a PhD, which, if, you know, this is always the thing with PhD people, like that when, when you're writing it, you know, you never can explain it. And you're like, oh, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how to say, it. I just, uh, you know, it's like, it's, and then you start saying all the stuff that nobody understands and you barely understand yourself. And then, uh, and then you finish it and you've got, and you've passed it and you got through and then people go, so what's it about? And you're like, Oh shit! I forgot to figure out how to say it, what it's about to people. I still <laughs> right, don't know right. how to say it. Like, yeah. I don't know what to say here. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah. So it's it's basically um, it's it's English literature stuff. It is lit it's literary studies. Um, so it's all about reading books and stories and things. Um, but it's through a couple different lenses. Um, one is like an ecological lens, and in in literary studies they call it eco criticism. But uh, yeah, so that's just like looking at how novels depict, you know, landscape and animals and relationships between humans and non-humans or uh, environmental disasters or whatever it may be, you know, just you, anything to do with the more than human world in a, in a book, a poem, you know, or whatever. Um, <clears throat> so I'm kind of doing that thing with the guys I'm looking at, Ari Lafferty and Cormac McCarthy, both of whom write a whole bunch about like Oklahoma and Texas in their landscapes and animals and things like that. Um, but the further element is is monster theory, which is like a sub discipline um, that studies monsters, you know, and, and what they mean culturally and stuff and all the different kinds from ancient Greek stuff to the latest, you know, vampire movie or whatever. And there's, you know, lots of anthologies with people writing essays about that kind of stuff. Um, so I'm kind of mixing the ecological and the monster studies type thing, um, monster theory and monster studies. And uh, looking at how these guys evoke their regions, um, which is like basically it encompasses the Great Plains, which go down through the middle of the states and the Southwest, which people think of as New, New Mexico and Arizona, which is the main focus, but it kind of actually extends beyond that. But so that's their regions. But they they instead of like doing it in like a here was the vast, beautiful plains with the sun, you know, warming them and all that kind of thing. It's like you know it's just like uh here's horrible people doing horrible things to each other in the midst of this landscape described as almost a monster in and of itself eating the people while they you know kill each other or something you know mm -hmm. kind of thing you know and yeah um or even just it's not always like really violent and stuff it can just be weird just really strange the way you know land and animals behave or humans behave in relation to their landscape and stuff um mm. it, could, it can be actually like fantastical or science fictional uh, or it can just be just the way it's evoked in a certain uh poetic mode you know that just it's creepy and monstery and stuff and sometimes often references monsters in the way it describes like a mountain or something um and so i was just looking at that kind of stuff and just writing a whole bunch about it and making up my own theory um nobody had said the term eco monstrous and i just made that up and tried to bullshit my way through like this is what it means and it's a new theory and you should listen to this you know <laughs> um, i love it i mean it sounds it sounds compelling to me i'm, I'm sold on the idea um <laughs> Yeah, my my wife is two years into writing a book, and there's another nearly year left, and she's still like, when people ask her what it's about, struggles to <laughs> do the <laughs> like elevator pitch because it's you know yeah. it's so complex and you're in your head about it a lot. Um, but yeah, I mean, eco monstrous is is a concept is just so fascinating to me, um, and the way you laid it out right now makes a lot of sense. I wouldn't have necessarily thought of a Cormac McCarthy environment as being monstrous. Um, in a, in a more like typical way you might think about monsters, but it absolutely lines up. That makes a uh, total sense. Um, and, you know, Lafferty might be a name that some people know, but maybe haven't read his books or and not as well known as, as McCarthy, um, at least here. Could you tell us a bit about what draws you to, to Lafferty's work in particular? Yeah, he's still really obscure. I mean, he's just now, you know, we'll see what happens with him, but he, he had, he had his first book, 
um, republished in the Library of America that does like every American author, you know, Hemingway or whoever they put out, you know, the Library of America edition of this book, you know, and whatever. And they they did one of his early science fiction novels called Past Master. Um, and there's a few other things like that sort of in the works and, and stuff happening. So he might become a little more well-known, but people like Neil Gaiman mm -hmm. um, and Bill Hader, <laughs> the com comedic actor and like uh, Patton Oswalt and mm -hmm. some of these comedian guys um, and, uh, and some of the fantastic uh, fantasists. Um, I'm trying to think, uh, Jeff Vandermeer, whose star is yeah. rising a little bit with the, mm -hmm. the movie Annihilation. Um, is based on his book and he's got there's a tv series coming out based on his work but it's like new weird fiction and stuff all mm. these guys like Lafferty um mm. some of them have known about him for years and years some of them have only recently discovered him and they're like whoa Lafferty you know he's the weirdest of the weird and that kind of thing but it's hard to describe how he's weird because he's not cool weird <laughs> he's more like a midwestern type weird I mean, <laughs> sure he's an Oklahoma guy and it's it's just it's it's like it's like outsider art he you know he didn't really do an education and stuff and and he the science fiction field kind of accepted his story so he kind of tried to write what he thought was science fiction but it's just you know, bizarre and uh funny he's very very funny but not not a comic not just like a comedy writer but it has a lot of hilarity to it but also a lot of weird weirdness and uncanniness and grotesque sometimes qu quite violent scenes here and there and stuff and hmm. um so yeah you know so he he wrote in the sort of 60s and 70s mainly um and it's just this really obscure kind of cult following sort of writer um yeah yeah you, you just you all you can do is look up his name and see what you can find because most of it's out of print and stuff and people sure. either get into it or they don't you know but but when you get into it you usually become an ultra fan you know <laughs> like, mm. i mean i, I mean it sounds it, pretty good it also sounds like blaster fans you know, <laughs> yeah yeah you know the people yes. that that yeah. are really into the band are really into the band and <laughs> i think that's that's why we had you know we had blaster evangelist being like you you need to cover <laughs> need to cover this band i mean we've even had some i mean speaking of mike not we've had people tell us we need to cover mike not at at some point um so that that might need to be on the uh be on the docket yeah for me i mean it's funny because you know you never know what people are going to think like you see it through this certain lens that was from when you were younger and everything but he's he, for me he's maybe like christian alternative rocks one true genius or something like mm. that i rate him pretty highly <laughs> yeah we had uh i mean we've had reese roper five iron on many times but he mm. in particular kind of said pretty much exactly the same thing <laughs> um so i i know that's a sentiment people share uh, among artists that i like trust so we need to we need to further dive into that um and and lafferty has i mean there's like a a faith component to his oh, writing right i mean that's an yeah, aspect of yeah 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 sorry yeah so that's actually how i initially got into him you know when you're when you discover c.s lewis or what whatever your sort of christian fiction type thing is which is usually c.s lewis you know as a as a young evangelical or whatever you're looking around for more of that stuff and you you know maybe you run into flannery o'connor or whatever and i discovered walker percy and basically a bunch of catholics write really good fiction gk chesterton and stuff like that mm -hmm. even if Tons of tons of stuff is problematic in, in different ones sure. in various ways. Um, but Lafferty's name just kind of came in at some point with some of that stuff of like being uh, a Catholic writer. And I remember checking out several different people and not necessarily getting into them. And so I knew that he was like supposed to be a Catholic writer or whatever, but I actually didn't really go find his stuff. I just was I bought a bunch of cheap um, 70s anthologies of multi-author science fiction anthologies. Um with all these, you know, Roger Zelazny and Harlan Ellison and Samuel Delaney. Ner nerds will know what that stuff is, but um, <laughs> um, <clears throat> it's like 70s New Wave SF is what it was called. And, and his name always appeared in these anthologies. And as I was reading through, eventually I found myself, I just didn't even want to read anything except if it said Lafferty. And that's the only thing I would buy. I would look through the table contents of Lafferty because they just stood out. They're hilarious and bizarre and just so full of wonder and monstrosity mm -hmm. and yeah, so it, um, and then, and then, so it was really, it was just how cool the stories were. And then I started to pick up on the faith component and stuff. I said, oh, he's got like a theological point of view here and stuff and got really into that and stuff. So um, in these days, you know, I, I would, and, and I don't even think I got 
no, I, I definitely did not get nearly enough into this in, in my thesis. Um, I, I basically saved his, the theological view of his work until the last chapter, and I explained why I do so in the beginning. It's not to keep it as a surprise or whatever, but it's just there's a lot of other stuff to cover to make sure you look at before you look at that. And um, and I'm basically only just tried to outline his sort of sacramental um, view of nature and stuff like that. Um, but there's a lot of critique to be done there, as you can imagine, you know, <laughs> a lot of problematic uh, um, perspectives and things, because he was, he was kind of a conservative, he was like a, he was like a, a, a um, you know, a third party sort of conservative, like, mm -hmm. didn't like either side, but, you know, had kind of conservative views, but, but he's so beloved of all these liberal um, authors and stuff, because there's something liberal at the heart of what he does, as well as kind of, something else wrestling in there and, and that kind of adds to his genius there's a there's a real tussle inside his heart and inside his work uh, between some bad and good impulses you know <laughs> it's very beautiful and some very ugly things and it just kind of adds to the artistry and the genius of it all but, yeah mm. i'm like super high on dune right now that's all i'm thinking about because i love the movie so much and you know i think it's a similar thing with uh frank herbert where he sort of has these i don't know how much you're into him or dune or anything but he has these obvious sort of like libertarian um mm. tendencies and that comes across in the books increasingly as he goes on so there's sort of a critique of, of both sides but yeah it's it maybe a similar sort of like using sci-fi as, as a means by which to talk about these different philosophies for for governing and stuff that might be similar yeah. but anyway yeah. And yeah, I read, not I read to mention the first... all the ecological stuff yeah. going going on in Dune as well. Yeah, yeah. And I read the first book years ago, and I loved that whole ecological vibe and stuff. And and definitely, I mean, the sandworms are definitely one of the greatest creations of yeah, you know, of imaginative literature. You know, they're just so awe inspiring, both literarily and on screen. Even when they're goofy on screen, they're still awesome. You know, um, yeah. I haven't seen the new the new Dune, but being a bit snobby and stuff, I also didn't totally love the writing. Like. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> or sure. not all of it. Yeah, you know, so, but yeah, it's something I've thought about revisiting. But I did, I did enjoy my that read of the first book. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, I, and I noticed what I noticed that really m m troubled me much more later is that, if, as I recall, a really creepy thing. You know, making the the guy making it part of his evil persona that he slept with boys or whatever. Yeah. You know? <laughs> like, That's like, in oh, there for God, sure. That. I'm like, oh. <laughs> that, that, uh, is missing from the new movie. Yeah. It's, <laughs> I can ex, imagine. Subplot has been excised. <laughs> yes. Yes. Anyway. Yeah. I, not a, not a fan of, <laughs> of that. I do have a question about what your, kind of into these days what you're listening to these days but also are there any anything coming out of uh scotland or any like local stuff that you're like you know want to shout out that people might be into is there is there like a a, a punk scene or anything going on in in scotland you know that that also makes me think of going way back in the conversation to indianapolis i will say at the, at the time that Blaster was playing and stuff, Indianapolis had a really decent like punk scene and, mm. and, and alternative music scene. And I think it's kind of kept up some of its interesting artists, despite being nowhere America, it often has interesting things going on artistically and stuff. Okay, so, but with Scotland, uh, now, now I'm gonna feel really bad about this because I don't, I don't feel that I do, you know, kind of have a grip on new interesting things coming out of, of uh, Scotland in general, Glasgow in particular. I will say Glasgow is huge music city. I mean, it is just music, 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 and has been for ages and ages and ages. You know, and Glasgow or thereabouts, or maybe sometimes other parts of Scotland, you know, gave us like um, the Jesus and Mary chain and mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the guys that Kurt Cobain was into. Um, no, 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 turn, turn, turn around. Yeah, uh, you, you know, um, the the Vaseline. Yeah. The Vaseline. Oh okay. yeah, yeah, right. Um, uh, you know, and uh, all kinds of you know, just, you know teenage fan club and and sure. uh, mm -hmm. Idlewild and just so many, so many uh, sort of indie and alternative and uh, noise rock and whatever sort of bands, and and indie pop sort of bands like Bell and Sebastian and all this kind of mm -hmm. stuff like have come from Scotland and a lot of it from Glasgow and stuff. So yeah, it's a huge, huge music scene with in some ways quite a reach um but you know uh 
what's going on now and stuff I'm not <laughs> totally clued into you know um so and I and you know we used to play in Voice of the Mistrons with bands in like sort of the mid 2000s or whatever with local bands and I and now I like totally forget their names and I'm not even sure if like did they go on and do anything I think they were quite similar just like us you just kind of underground bands that had a little splash you know and and whatever but um I remember really liking them at the time but I've completely forgotten their names and stuff so yeah I can't really shout out to like exactly what's coming up and out of, of Scotland music wise per se I don't I do think there's a lull in like punk and or alternative or aggressive or extreme or experimental sort of music unless you know there's definitely always some kind of indie-ish and you know what I think of as kind of hipster-ish sort of like thing going on that's like creative and interesting but for me just a bit tame and you know there's sure. always something like that going on but. speaking of Glasgow I wanted to say uh condolences I heard about the that the Glasgow Comedy Festival is no more, that they're they're not doing it anymore. I hadn't even heard that. I haven't heard what all's, uh, you know, not happening anymore. <laughs> yeah, this was, um, this was like last, uh, this was like pretty recent. Mm. Um, but did that, I mean, that's, that was, I feel like that was kind of a, a big deal, but did you, were you ever able to, go to any no of the... no i never i never went to that or you know was much involved with any there's a big thing called fringe the fringe festival in edinburgh that i only went to bits and pieces of once or twice and things like that so yeah i haven't been really involved with with a lot of those kinds of things uh it's weird what they can seem to keep going and not keep going because i think the glasgow film festival has been thing, a big thing for a long time and they've managed to somehow keep that going even partly online and stuff you know with everything going on but I, no, I hadn't heard about the comedy festival it's going through a lull but I think Glasgow is just made of that kind of stuff just absolutely all about producing culture you know yeah. um, of various kinds and it, it's not going to stay down long but people sure. are just too too uh um I almost said too mental here <laughs> that's probably <laughs> not the best thing to say but like, they're just so full of life and and just wildness and you know not that everybody's just roaming the streets half naked <laughs> screaming or whatever, but I just mean, there's just a lot of, it's a, it's a lively place with lively people that yeah. are not going to sit around and do nothing, you know? <laughs> so, sure. Yeah. You know, uh, we're talking film festivals, speaking of films. Uh, I saw that you, you gave a keynote address uh, partly on Guillermo del Toro at some point. Mm -hmm. um, what's your favorite del Toro movie? Do you, you want to talk del Toro for a second? <laughs> Uh, favorite Del Toro movie. Um, it may sound disappointing, but I would I would have to say, as total movies, Hellboy one and two are I think Man. the ones for me. I know everybody you expect you should say Pan's Labyrinth, right? You know something like. But, eh. but Hellboy two but, is like a perfect movie in my opinion. Yeah, <laughs> I like, love Hellboy two. I, I wrote a I wrote an essay on Hellboy one and two for a, for a book called Divine Horror, mm. and everybody was covering different movies and stuff cool and, <laughs> sounds yeah, awesome and, and i i quoted a, an academic saying hellboy 2 didn't add anything to the mythos or the philosophy of the first film and stuff and mm. like took great umbrage with it and was like are you kidding me you know like look what it did the fairy tales and horror and, you yeah. know, like, and ecology and everything you know <laughs> yeah but um yeah so so just they're just so entertaining and they hold together really well on a lot of levels and there's a lot i think there's more room for his love of monsters and creating monsters and crafting monsters to come through in those uh it, which one has the troll market is that that's two isn't it that's two yeah yeah you know so yeah it just he just gets to let loose and i want to see yeah. him do more i mean the shape of water is beautiful and and lovely on so many levels and so interesting and so cool to focus in on a singular monster but i i like del toro the more monsters he puts in a film to, if he's really <laughs> crafting them the better for me so you know yeah. pan's labyrinth even is like oh it's like what three three four right. you know <laughs> yeah but they are but they're, they're pretty nice you know and, and it, it's a cool arty dark film but um but yeah I, I like the hellboy movies the best and have you heard about his project that got rejected to do lovecraft at the mountains of madness, mountains of madness. i mean that's if there's a movie i, I would like to see that <laughs> doesn't exist that's have. that's number one yeah i'm pretty sure I mean, that will be my favorite del toro film but, but i don't think it's ever going to get made because <laughs> he, he I, wants to make it a rate an 18 rated or r-rated movie right you know, and they're just not going to green light it 
Yeah, you would think post, you know, winning best picture and best director that that would be his moment to sort of do that. Yeah. And if it hasn't happened yet, I'm not sure it will. But yeah, um, yeah or, or mean, even like his monsters in Pacific Rim, you know, Pacific Rim is kind of iffy as a, as a whole film. I think it's got yeah. some a cool little mythos and some fun mm -hmm. stuff. But but I, I could look at those kaiju all day long with their yeah. glowing and they're moving around and just like, oh, so beautiful. <laughs> but I love giant monsters. I mean, giant monsters are <laughs> my jam they're my ultimate <laughs> and if you, if you do like with that movie and gareth edwards godzilla the first the whole franchise is kind of a bit boring I, I go to see him because i have to i must but sure. um but that that first godzilla where he just does all this camera work panning over body parts of kaiju and stuff i'm like <gasps> i'm like yeah it's a little bit pornographic for me i'm so <laughs> <laughs> oh man I'm, I'm here for monsters of all sizes but i understand that the, the <laughs> giant monster in particular has has its has its own draw yeah. um <laughs> You know, uh, Divine Horror, I will definitely check that out. There's another book that you contributed to uh, called uh, Hybrid Moments, a literary tribute to the Misfits, which uh, also sounds like something I need to get my hands on immediately. Um, and you, your essay for that was uh, Reality of the Wolf, right? Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, that was actually a short story. It's a, it's okay. a collection of fiction based around okay. Misfits lyrics. And I chose cool. the song, the song, is it Demonomania? Demon. yeah demonomania yeah <laughs> my mother was a whore my father was a wolf I, I, in good blaster style i took that quite literally and built my my story around that that uh -huh. idea um and quoted a lot of the lyrics so i took it from the if you i'd never really properly read those lyrics and it's just, it's it's kind of this singular voice saying i am the beast and and all this kind of stuff and uh and so i just that's who's telling the story um but from a perspective of a somebody who grew up with a single mother who was a prostitute and whose mother's mother was a prostitute and um and uh got got raped by a client um who who was a werewolf um mm. so it's kind of con i'm still still probably unwisely treading into this like prostitution territory like you know, sure the, the sluts and whores and tramps or whatever i said on sure. stuff, yeah. but, I mean, that's but in I the song to, though yeah <laughs> but i was trying to take uh, what i thought was a sympathetic and feminist sort of perspective on it but i i read it again recently i was really proud of it at the time and i was surprised that they took it i'd never had people i didn't know like take a story and they paid me a tiny bit of money for it you know per word you know and i was like wow i got paid and they selected my story and everything, you know, but I, I don't, some of it still resonates and is pretty cool, but where I tried to go into this sort of theological realm, just because the, the song actually suggested that to me, I, I didn't think it quite worked, but it's a fun experiment, but it's, it's, it's like so many things I make. It's like, then it's out there frozen in amber and I'm like, oh, sure. you know, I want yeah. another shot at it, you know? Yeah. Sure, sure. <laughs> well, I still want to read it. <laughs> um, so we uh you know i think it was floated on twitter um at some point um that members of five iron frenzy would uh be down with doing some sort of show if there's a blaster reunion is that is a blaster reunion a blaster you know one-off kind of thing is that ever in the cards again will we ever we've covered so many bands on this on this pod that we're like we were like we just discovered them recently and we're like we missed it we will <laughs> never see certain bands again and you know is there can you give us any hope <laughs> <laughs> you know i I will, because at this point, it's just me being sadistic and cruel to give people hope about this and masochistic too, because I can't give up on the idea. I, I'm just like, yeah, surely we can put that together at some point. Definitely. It's going to happen. But I, I'm just, I'm just never in the States enough yeah. to kind of, to kind of put it together and practice and, and, and get it going. But um, I think you strangely enough the more time that goes by that i think there's more momentum to to make it happen and i think even you know even the stuff we're talking about kind of developing beliefs wise and things kind of helps mm -hmm. in a way because um we can start to know where we stand now about a lot of things and have some distance and be able to revisit it with um you know uh, a certain amount of uh celebrating something from the past but 
with some sense of humor and self-deprecation right. and and like uh and, and forgiveness <laughs> for sure. ourselves and, and whatever and and my brother the the main musician you know he he ne- he he was never super into the christian thing he just was in a christian family and you know kind of had to play along to a certain degree for a little while but he didn't he didn't you know he wasn't really self-professing as a christian for very long into his young adult years um and so I think even now he could maybe come back and revisit it with, with a little less cringe and, and have fun <laughs> playing it and stuff, you know? Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, you know, I think the key is getting me and my brother back together and finding some other guys to help, to help do it. And uh, yeah, I, I'm sorry. I will be cruel and dangle that and say, I, I still think it can happen. I still, you know, we're still just, I think we've got another 10 years that will be will be hale enough in body and mind to to, <laughs> to make it happen but hopefully sooner than that <laughs> man let us let us know what we can do to contribute to this effort okay. uh, we uh we would very much like to see this happen i mean is there uh apart from that like are there is there any music you think that uh may come from your sort of artistic focus or, or is it more purely writing that you're looking at these days like do you anticipate any music coming out um i mean i don't anticipate any but it's it's sure. all i hate to say i mean it's i'm really bad for this everything's always on the cards for me like, sure. oh yeah i'm gonna write this article and that book and uh this fiction and that song and you know because i you know I, I i want to and there's all there's a million sketches and notebooks of stuff and but it's not really notebooks anymore is it it's, it's like on uh what's the online thing google docs you know it's all yeah, yeah. Docs, right? um you know so you know i'm always kind of <clears throat> messing about with that in my head and stuff and and i still have a desire to to make music sometimes and sing and my brother and i made a few demos over the years just like three songs i think um but the, the last two we did were I don't know, three or four years ago. So it wasn't even that long ago mm. that I was like in front of a mic singing with my brother cool. making new music and I was writing new lyrics and stuff. And as demos, I thought they sounded great. I thought they were really fun, cool songs that, that we need to kind of come back to and, and develop more and make more songs around them and stuff. And they were kind of, they weren't blaster songs, but they were, I think they were kind of in the same musical universe and stuff. Um, mm. but yeah, so I do, you know, I do still sing whenever I get a, a chance and I keep thinking about trying to, the musicians I know in Glasgow don't play that kind of music, but I, I keep thinking of being like, hey guys, I got a crazy idea. Why don't you play, try to play some really hard music with me, really heavy stuff. It'll be something yeah. different for you. You'll love it. You know? Yeah, yeah. You're going to play some corn surf or <laughs> exactly. surf corn or whatever you call it. <laughs> it sounds um, too much like a Midwesterner just saying corn syrup. Corn syrup. <laughs> right, corn, no, syrup. corn syrup. All right. I also just think of, syrup. I also just think of like, you know jonathan davis from corn just like <laughs> standing in a field of corn or something different different corn different kind of corn <laughs> where are they from aren't they from california or something like that i don't know who knows they like west coast i think no. so that yeah. would make that would make sense they got yeah. that vibe <laughs> is there uh you've been very generous with your time uh we've had uh, a lot of uh, cool discussions so far but is there anything that you wanted to maybe get to or address that we didn't get to touch on at all yet um oh man wish i had something cool to like hawk you know be like hey everybody <laughs> check out this go to this website you know <laughs> well i think people should check out <laughs> eco monstrous underscore ontography <laughs> on instagram uh <laughs> where you'll find some fascinating spooky images uh, paired with your writing on monsters and ecology really cool stuff there yeah yeah there's that and uh you know by if people are really that into checking it out, that that thesis is available online for free to, to cool. look at. If you just kind of look up Eco Monsters Poetics University of Glasgow or something, you'll find it pretty easily. But I'm trying, you know, I'm trying to find time to pitch that properly to publishers to to make it a book. And I I'm quite confident it will become a book. Uh, it's just like, is it going to be way down the food chain of publishers, you know, that put out every thesis that somebody has made, you know, or will it be one of the, you know, higher up publishers and, and get a real makeover and a nice presentation? I don't know, but that's kind of one of my main focuses right now. And that's just, you know, when you do this academic stuff, it's like, it's all hidden and it takes forever. And then something finally comes out way down the road and whatever. So it's not like exciting, like stuff that you can even do like a Patreon for or something like, Hey guys, check out what's going on now. You know, yeah, I wrote sure. another sentence because I read <laughs> another 5,000 word essay that gave me an idea, you know? And like, you know? Yeah. Well, 
folks can find your your writing online right and your uh, social channels um mm-hmm. we encourage everybody to do that yes. um this this has been so fun so fun man i feel like i, I could i could ask you so many more questions and perhaps mm-hmm there'll be occasion for you to come back to the pod someday, but uh, we really, really appreciated you taking the time and talking about this stuff with us. Well, I loved it. And I appreciate you guys and what you're doing and just the approach you've got. It's perfect. I just love it. It's just like great. And I'm looking forward to hearing you do more stuff and kind of going through some of the back stuff, the back catalog of your stuff. And, and I really do hope some more people do this kind of stuff. Cause there's a lot of, there's a lot of different stuff to cover, you know, you know, somebody could do a whole yeah. metal thing, you know, and whatever, and mm-hmm. just all kinds of stuff, but, yeah yeah so it's been fun i appreciate it thanks, thanks we man. uh we we're kind of going genre seasonal base now so you know yeah. metal metal season not out of the question okay nice <laughs> <laughs> thanks again for your time uh blast your reunion within the next 10 years confirmed we'll share that with everybody <laughs> <laughs> and uh yeah. yeah take care daniel Th- uh, all thanks right for you guys too. Thanks. thanks a lot For more shows like this one, visit rockcandyrecordings.com.